start it up. All right, thank you. Good morning. The time is now 9.38 a.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of August 11th, 2020 is called to order. Due to the COVID-19 national emergency and in accordance with Executive Directive 2020-2 and Executive Order 2020-154, the State Board of Education regular and committee of the whole meeting is being convened with remote access technology. First item on the agenda is the approval of agenda and order of priority. Are there any items board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? Uh, hearing and seeing none, may I please have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Uh, moved and do I hear, have a second? Second. Lupe, second. second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Did you do a roll call? Uh, roll Aye. call vote given the uh, technology. Thank you. Okay, Fecto. Yes. McMillan. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Uh, Pew, it, we're trying, She's. she'll be here shortly, but she's absent currently. Ramos Mondini. Yes. Snyder will be here shortly, absent currently. Tilly? Tiffany Tilly? She's Maybe in the meeting chat. Just, just her, yeah, I. Albrich? Uh, yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much, Marilyn. This time, Marilyn Schneider, uh, State Board Executive, whom you just heard, will introduce the members of the State Board of Education. Happy to do so. Uh, Dr. Cassandra Albrich is the president from Dearborn. Dr. Pamela Pugh, vice president from Saginaw. Ms. Michelle Fecto, secretary from Detroit. Mr. Tom McMillan, treasurer from Oakland Township. Ms. Tiffany Tilly, NASB delegate, from Southfield, that's the Boards Association, National Association of State Boards of Education. Ms. Lupe Ramos-Montini, Chair of the Board's Legislative Committee from Grand Rapids. Dr. Judy Pritchett, Co-Chair of the Legislative Committee from Washington Township. Ms. Nikki Snyder, State Board Legislative Committee member from Dexter. Uh, Ms. Brandy Johnson, the Governor's Policy Advisor for Education and Workforce and she is representing the governor who serves as an ex officio member of the State Board of Education. And that's all we've got. Everybody's going to be attending this meeting. So thank you, Dr. Rice. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, there are two resolutions that require approval before we move to the presentations. A resolution honoring the 2019-2020 Michigan Teacher of the Year, Kara Lougheed and a resolution honoring the 2020-2021 Michigan Teacher of the Year, Owen Bondano. May I please have a motion to approve the resolutions? So moved. Support. Moved, it's been moved and? Support. A second. And supported. Any discussion of the resolution? All in favor, let's do a roll call vote. Uh, if only because it's hard to know who said I virtually. Roll call vote, Marilyn, please. Okay, yes. Um, Fecto. Aye. McMillan. Yes. Pritchett. Yes. Pew, I believe, absent currently, trying to join us. Ramos Montini. Snyder. Absent, trying to join us, Tilly. Tilly says aye. And Albrich, also aye, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Kara Lougheed is the 2019-2020 Michigan Teacher of the Year. She is a high school teacher at Stony Creek High School in Rochester Community Schools. Ms. Lawhees has been a tremendously valuable resource during this unprecedented time. She and the Regional Teachers of the Year have spent 
countless hours developing guidance and sharing their extensive expertise. Ms. Lougheed has been a passionate advocate for students, teachers, and public education. She was an outstanding role model for and representative of the teaching profession. We thank Kara for her dedication and contributions to the field. I know firsthand how hardworking and influential she is among her peers. I can think of few people who could perform in the role as Michigan Teacher of the Year as effectively as Kara has done this year, especially the last few months in the midst of a pandemic. She is a force, she is a leader, and I fully anticipate that she will continue to be a force and a leader in Michigan public education for many years to come. Ms. Lougheed will give her final report as the 2019-2020 Michigan Teacher of the Year, Ms. Kara Lougheed. Please check the chat. Kara had something in the chat, right? So Kara, we we do not see you at the moment. At least I do not see you at the moment. Okay. This is Marilyn. Kara, can you call in to the meeting appointment? And then we will be able to hear you. So while Kara is calling into the meeting, um, I would just like to make a few comments and um, talk about how much I appreciated her um, tenure as Teacher of the Year. I thought, she, Kara, you brought a lot to um, the table. And uh, unfortunately, when we all had to go virtual, I think you were definitely a, a leader and, and continued to show a lot of um, provide a lot of valuable input. So I just want to say how much I appreciated uh, Kara as the Michigan Teacher of the Year and um, look forward to the next great things that she does in her career. Kara, are you successfully um, joining us by voice right now? I can hear you now. Can you all hear me? I'm going to mute we, my computer. We, we can. Thanks for working okay. through the difficulty. Sorry about that. I, um, it's a long story, but I don't have the app on my computer anymore, and I think that's the problem. But I wanted to thank you all for your kind words, Dr. Rice. That was, you're making me tear up a little bit with that. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Rice and the board members for welcoming me this year and encouraging me to share my perspective. You've all been so supportive. Um, and I want to thank Sheila and Vanessa Kiesler for teaching me so much about how MDE works and giving me confidence in what goes on there. I didn't know much about the department and they've really taught me a lot. Um, and then Jen and Josh and Shelby and everyone at the Office of Educator Excellence have been so incredible to work with. And thank you for putting up with all of my um, constant questions and all my <laughs> fantastic ideas. <laughs> um, and so I want to say congratulations to all of the 2021 uh, Regional Teachers of the Year. I wish we could all be together, but I know that someday I will get to meet you and, um, and give you all a big hug. 
I'm really excited for all of you. And then Owen, I just want to say, we talked last night, so you know how excited I am for you. Um, and I know a lot of this might feel a little surreal and you might have a little bit of imposter syndrome, but that's totally normal. Um, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Your voice matters, your experience and expertise and your perspective, it all matters. So share it. And remember that for many reasons, educators and students around the state are going to be listening and learning from you. I am always, as you know, a text or a call away if you need me, but I think you are in good hands and you are going to be just fine. Thank you for a fantastic year, everyone. Thank you, Kira. Uh, board members, any comments? Comments or reflections for our Michigan 2019-2020 um, State Teacher of the Year? Tiffany Tilly has put in the chat, thank you so much for your service. I'm sorry COVID-19 cut our time short with you. We appreciate you. Thank you, board member Tilly. Uh, other board members, President Albrich already shared her reflections. Anyone else? Can you hear me? This is Michelle. Um, I just wanted to say um, that I, I loved how you uh, held up all the other teachers uh, around the state and gave them an opportunity um, to also talk about uh, their ideas as well. Um, I think a good teacher is someone, a great teacher is someone who holds up others in the profession and um, and you did that and I was really impressed and uh, appreciated that. Thank you. Is that a hand up Dr. Pritchett? Yes it is, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Kara, I uh, just wanted to uh, say uh, thanks to you for your work this year. Um, we've already noted many times that none of us expected uh, a pandemic, but you rose to the occasion and showed uh, leadership uh, that you probably didn't even know you um, possessed, but uh, you did a fabulous job. Uh, I remember the day that you it was announced at Stony Creek High School, I had the privilege of being there with Sheila uh, and the surprise look on your face and yet the humility you showed at that point. Um, you will do great things for your students and for teachers across the state of Michigan in the future. So thank you for your service this year. Uh, and uh, I hope to see you again at some point during your career. Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Uh, Ms. Ramos Montini. Well, from a teacher to a teacher, I congratulate you for such a fantastic job that you did this year. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to see her in action at a town hall meeting that uh, Senator Mallory organized. And uh, of course, Kara was the representative as, uh, from the teacher side as the Michigan Teacher of the Year. And she did one fantastic job. Uh, I, that's one of the uh, town hall meetings that I emulate. And if we're planning one here in my side of the state, I am uh, following their uh, strategic plan that they used and they were so effective in reaching out to the students. So Kara, uh, you made us proud, all of teachers, you made us real, real proud and I congratulate you for a job well done. Thank you, Ms. Ramos Montini. Other board members? Other board members, okay. Hearing and seeing none. On July 17th, during a virtual meeting with the 2021 Regional Teachers of the Year, board member Michelle Fecto and I participated in the surprise announcement that named Owen Bondano as the 2020-2021 Michigan Teacher of the Year. Mr. Bondano teaches English language arts in the Oak Park High School, ninth grade learning community. He has over 10 years of classroom experience as a teacher and a paraprofessional and was selected from hundreds of nominees statewide. This presentation will be facilitated by Dr. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent of Educator, Student and School Supports, and Ms. Jennifer Robel, Manager of the Recruitment and Recognition Unit in the Office of Educator Excellence. Ladies, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Rice, and good morning, board members. 
Uh, we are excited to be here. This is one of our favorite events of the whole year, I think. And even though this year it definitely took on a different flavor, um, it's still just as exciting to be honoring another Michigan Teacher of the Year. So with that, I'm going to turn it to Jen and uh, for our presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kiesler and Dr. Rice and board members. I appreciate uh, you letting us be here today. I do have a coworker with me, so I apologize if you hear some noise in the background or to the side. Um, the Michigan Teacher of the Year program organized by the Michigan Department of Education, Office of Educator Excellence, and sponsored by the Mimic Education Foundation, identifies exceptional teachers in our state, recognizes their effective work in the classroom, amplifies their voices, and empowers them to participate in policy discussions at the state level. Teachers are recognized both regionally and at a statewide level. Regional Teachers of the Year and the Michigan Teacher of the Year comprise the Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council and serve as an invaluable resource to the Michigan Department of Education and other state education stakeholders by representing the view of teachers in important policy discussions, especially during this time. In addition to serving as the head of the Michigan Teacher Leadership Advisory Council, the Michigan Teacher of the Year represents Michigan teachers at national events organized by the Council of Chief State School Officers, and the Michigan Teacher of the Year is the candidate for the year's National Teacher of the Year. The R Toys and the M Toy were selected following a very rigorous multi-level process that began with more than 400 total nominations this year. They were nominated by students, staff, community members, parents, guardians, resulting in 105 applications for Part A. So now, please give us a little grace and hope this happens Perfectly. Let's watch the moment when Owen is announced as M Toy. Josh, if you can put that up for me, please. Oh, well, I, I, I am very honored to be here and thrilled to um, be able to make this announcement. Um, I know every single one of you are outstanding and, and, and incredible teachers. But so I, without further ado, it is my honor to announce that the next uh, Michigan Teacher of the Year for 2020 is Owen Bondono. <laughs> Congratulations. Owen is a ninth grade teacher at Oak Park High School's ninth grade learning community in Oak Park Schools. Owen, uh, if you'd like to unmute and say a few words. Sure. Um, as soon as I remember how to breathe again, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> uh, uh, it's odd to think of myself as a teacher leader because I think in many ways I still think of myself as a beginner teacher. Um, I think the wonderful thing I've noticed already about all of my fellow regional teachers of the year is that a, lot, a little bit of that. like we are learning and getting better and I think that we represent in a lot of ways the um, the spirit of teaching which is to be constantly learners ourselves and to use that ability to be learners to help others be learners um, so I am so so excited to be working with these people and I um, my brain doesn't work when I pause to think about the fact that I am apparently leading you, um, but uh, I'm, I'm honored to do so. And uh, it will be my goal this year to use this position and this honor to do my best to further um, the advocacy in our state for all students and all teachers and to continue what Kara has been doing to make our state better for all of us. Um, we have a moment right now that is unique, and I think that we can use that unique moment to push forward the things that we know we need to do and need to get better at, as well as celebrating the things that we're doing well. Um, as teachers, we all did something extraordinary this spring, something that we were never prepared for, and I think that we showed ourselves and everyone else what we're capable of. And I'm excited to continue doing that into the unknown that is going to be this coming school year. So thank you. I am literally speechless, despite the speech I just gave. 
I am excited to move forward. Thank you very much. So with that, uh, Dr. Rice and board members, um, Mr. Owen Bandono. Owen, are you there? Hi, can you guys see and hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm very excited to see how the State Board of Education runs and how I can be a part of this and help move things forward. Um, thank you for the honor that was bestowed upon me. Uh, I think you can see in that clip that I spent the entire speech last time with television static through my brain. Um, so, so thank you very much for the honor and I uh, am already doing my best to make sure that I am standing up for everyone in our state in every way that I can and using my voice as effectively as possible. So I'm excited to work with you guys and see how this collaboration makes our state better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Owen. Okay, so now uh, Dr. Rice, if it's okay with you, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, the other nine regional teachers of the year and Josh is gonna put their pictures up um, on the screen. They're here watching, um, but I just thought it'd be a better visual for you all to see their pictures as I um, announce their names. Uh, region one is Tana Hoffman. She's an elementary teacher at JKL Bawedding on a, on a national on Nash Nye Bay <laughs> Public School Academy. I practiced that all morning. I apologize. Uh, Region two, Dave Bunn is a biology and STEM teacher at Houghton Lake Junior Senior High School in Houghton Lake Community Schools. Region three, Chantel Vandergalen is an eighth grade English teacher at Wyoming Junior High School in Wyoming Public Schools. Region four, Barb Houston is a third grade teacher at Arrowwood Elementary School in Saginaw Township Community Schools. Erin Carlson is an English and STEM teacher in region five with Sandusky Junior Senior High School. Region six is Chelsea Schramm. She's an elementary school teacher at Morris Elementary School in Morris. Region seven is Liz Honeysett. She is an art and wood tech teacher at Portage Central High School and Portage Public Schools. She is not with us today because she had mandatory PD for her district. Region eight, Sarah Soper is an English teacher at Northwest High School and Northwest Community Schools in Jackson. Janine Scott is from Region 10. She's a math teacher in Davis Aerospace Technical High School in Detroit Public Schools Community School District. I also want to take a moment to thank Pam Harlan, who is on the call. She's the director of the Mimic Education Foundation. And uh, Mimic has graciously once again uh, agreed to sponsor M-Toy and the R-Toys and provide a $1,000 check to Owen School, Oak Park High School ninth grade learning community. And um, board members, if you get a chance, I can send you Pam's contact information if you just want to send a thank you. I, I would appreciate that. She has been, they've been a great partner over the past uh, 15 years. So with that, Dr. Rice and board members, I would like to formally introduce you to the Region 9 Teacher of the Year and the 2021 Michigan Teacher of the Year, Owen Van Dono a ninth grade teacher at Oak Park High School, ninth grade learning community in Oak Park Schools. And right now, I believe uh, Mertz Owen will give his presentation. Is that correct? Yes, Jennifer, that'd be just fine. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, Owen, if you want to say a few words or if Dr. Rice, you'd like to say a few words. I am. Um, before Owen makes a presentation. Owen, please go ahead. We uh, we welcome you and we congratulate you. Great job. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you don't hear my dog barking in the background. Uh, <laughs> I um, I did want to take a moment to say that uh, I, as I alluded to in the statement we saw me make earlier, um, I think we are in a unique moment right now where we have the change or the, the moment to reevaluate some of the practices going on in education in our state, uh, both in terms of what will work for 
during a pandemic and in terms of what can we take from this moment to move forward into the sort of quote unquote regular world of education. Um, and I'm excited to make one of my missions the evaluation of how we educate during a pandemic and what we can do to take some of these best practices and move them forward into our normal school year. Um, so I'm excited to see how this year looks and I think that the work we do this year is going to be very different from maybe what the work in past years has been and I'm excited to be a part of that different work. Thank you very much. Congratulations. You have very, very big shoes uh, to uh, to fill. But each um, each state teacher of the year grows during the year. And um, you're already of substantial stature to begin with. And uh, we look forward to your growth and your contributions during this important coming um, coming year. Uh, Jennifer, are we done with the presentation? Um, we are. I, um, Mertz, did you want him to do his presentation now or later? You, did he have slides to show right now, Jennifer? Hold on, I don't want to talk about you like you're not here. He does. Josh, Josh is throwing si slides for you was my understanding. Josh, can you throw those up? And then um, I just want to thank my staff really quick, Dr. Rice, through this whole thing. Uh, it's been crazy, as you know, and um, they've been phenomenal. And Chelsea, who left us earlier this year, and Josh and Shelby, um, just Phenomenal, so I just wanted to thank them. Thank you. Um, um, so yes, this is just, I wanted to give you a, an introduction to who I am so we are familiar with each other. Uh, again, my name is Owen Bondano um, and I'm excited to be here. Go ahead, Josh. Uh, so who am I? This is uh, the picture that's been all over the news with me, although my dog has been cropped out criminally for most of the times it's been on the news. Um, I am a teacher in Oak Park, Michigan. Um, I teach, a, uh, I'm a public school teacher. Uh, my building is the uh, Oak Park Ninth Grade Academy. My pronouns are he, him, or they, them. My education is from Wayne State University where I have a Bachelor of, Sil uh, of Science in Secondary English Education. I also have had a minor in English as a Second Language. So you can see both of those are my certifications. Uh, I have two years of substitute teaching, two years of paraprofessional, and at this point, five years as a certified teacher. In addition to that, I also have uh, many years experience of teaching summer school before I got my certification. So my professional experience at this point is about 11 years of professional experience. This was me photobombing some students who decided to take selfies in my class a couple years ago. I love this picture. Um, I would describe myself, my vision, my vision statement as a teacher and advocate growing all students into confident communicators. I think being a, a good communicator is one of the key principles of my job, as well as making sure that all students are critical thinkers and that they are empathetic to the world around them. These are some of my areas of interest. Uh, I would I wanted to put these out there because I know that there's a lot of work going on at the state level. And uh, if there's anything going on that you think I could be useful to or that I might be able to forward, I want you to be able to tap me when those things apply. So I am uh, interested in what inclusive schools look like in creating LGBTQ safe spaces for students and for staff in specifically anti-racist pedagogy and abolitionist teaching in the effort to go gradeless or have a more mastery based education system uh, in de developing classroom communities, which is something I take a lot of pride in. You can see here some of my ninth graders from two years ago before we took a trip uh, and of course many other interests not limited to this list. Just to highlight a few things that I've accomplished so far in my relatively short career, I have developed and piloted multiple courses, including creative writing and a games based reading and math intervention. Uh, I've obviously collaborated with other teachers. This past year, our ninth grade ELA team uh, reshaped what, what ELA looks like for our building in an effort to go without grades. Uh, so that's something I've accomplished and I'm very interested in continuing. I have experiencing developing, experience developing thematic units and project-based learning opportunities for K through 12. I am the Queer Straight Alliance founding faculty advisor for my building, and I have developed and facilitated LGBTQ safe space trainings for my school staff. 
Um, as the Michigan Teacher of the Year, I created a few mission statements for myself to keep both myself and my work focused. So my mission statements are to evaluate the effects of the pandemic on education and rethink best practices moving forward, to help to create classrooms and schools that will uplift all students from communities uh, from all communities and backgrounds with practices that are rooted in queer affirming anti-racist abolitionist teaching, uh, to advocate for new and future teachers with the goal of recruiting and retaining teachers who align better with the diversity of our student population, to assist all teachers, schools, and districts in prioritizing student social emotional health, and to be what Laverne Cox calls a possibility model for other trans and queer people in education and beyond. Uh, so one last selfie of me. This should also be the little circle of me down in the bottom, I think, if I've done this correctly. Uh, I can't wait to work with you all and create better schools. I think that this is uh, the kind of opportunity I never expected to have in my career, and I'm excited to see what can be accomplished with this opportunity. Thank you very much for giving me the time today. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Dr. Rice and board members. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Owen. Congratulations to you and to all the regional teachers of the year. It's a signature moment in your lives and in your careers. We look forward to working with you in the coming um, year. Board members, any uh, reflections for our regional teachers of the year before we move on? OK, President Albrich. I just want to say, Owen, welcome to the table, um, even though we're technically not at the table these days, uh, but um, we're excited to have you and look forward to your contributions to the State Board of Education and particularly in this trying time. I really appreciate your first bullet point, which is to um, really study the, the pandemic that we're in right now and to identify what new best practices can look like moving forward. So really looking forward to having those conversations with you and welcome. Thank you, President Albrecht. Uh, other uh, other board members, any other reflections? Ms. Ramos Montini. I just want to say welcome and congratulations to the Michigan Teacher of the Year. It is exciting to have a new one and we look forward to working with you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramos Montini. Other um, other board members, once, twice, thrice. I believe that we have uh, Dr. Pugh joining us by phone, and I believe um, Ms. Snyder will be joining us by phone as well. Ms. Robo, thank you. Uh, Regional Teachers of the Year, State Teacher of the Year, Bandano, uh, thank you. Congratulations. We look forward to our work together. Thank you. We are uh, we are now going to pivot to a uh, return to school uh, presentation, followed quickly uh, by a um, a presentation on strategic plan. Um, so, board members and members of the community, good morning again. In two parts of the meeting today, we'll share reflections about aspects of the education community's efforts to address the COVID-19 pandemic, to keep children and staff safe, and to maintain some measure of stability and strength in the education of our children. In a moment, I'll share with you where we are on a variety of policy issues affecting pre-K-12 public education in the pandemic. In the afternoon, MSU professor Catherine Strunk will share with you the results of her team's analysis of school districts spring continuity of learning plans and of spring teacher and principal survey data. Over the coming year, I anticipate that different members of our MDE team and different research partners uh, will provide ongoing updates. Board, you've heard me reflect about how quickly things change in a pandemic. When we began our March 10th state board meeting, there were no publicly confirmed COVID-19 positive cases. By the end of that March 10th meeting, there were two. Two days later, on March 12th, the governor closed schools in the state for in-person instruction for three weeks. 20 days later, on April 2nd, she closed them for the remainder of the school year. I appreciate the governor's swift and strong work during the pandemic. It has certainly saved many lives in the state. 
When I walked into the State Emergency Operations Center for the first time five months ago on March 11th, I saw the Johns Hopkins University coronavirus map on an enormous wall in the front of the room. It noted that there were 121,000 COVID-19 cases worldwide. March 11th, five months ago, 121,000 COVID-19 cases worldwide. Yesterday evening, just a few short hours ago, we passed 20 million cases worldwide and 734,000 deaths. Nationally, we had more than 5 million cases and more than 163,000 deaths by the end of yesterday evening. What a difference five months make. At this moment, we are dealing with an extraordinary health crisis that has adversely affected all aspects of our country and most of the world. Our schools face uncertainty in many areas, including but not limited to public health, finances, instructional delivery models, and days, hours, attendance, and enrollment. While we can't resolve all these uncertainties, we can work together to help our schools, our educators, our students, our families, and our communities address many of them and provide the best education possible for our children. The pandemic has affected different regions in Michigan and even different cities and towns in Michigan in different ways. Just as districts adopted very different continuity of learning plans in the spring, they are adopting very different plans for the fall. There are, after all, 831 uh, LEAs in the state, local education agencies in the state. The plans that these 831 LEAs uh, adopt must respond to the many unique circumstances across communities. In many areas of Michigan, the COVID numbers are high. In these areas, especially some of our educators, our parents and students feel anxious and even fearful about a return to school. As I've said before, we all want to be in school to begin the year. As a rule, schools are the best places for children to learn and for teachers to teach. As a rule, they are far superior to education at a distance. But pandemics aren't rules. They are exceptions. This fall, some of our students will be educated in schools and others at a distance. Indeed, this fall, some schools will educate almost all of their children in person, while others educate virtually all of their children at a distance. These differences will be in significant measure a function of the decisions of residents, parents and educators who will be basing their decisions on what they think is best for the health, safety and wellness of their unique communities. I'm going to share briefly on a few themes today, school funding, days, hours, attendance and enrollment, assessments and our recently established education equity fund. School funding. Three years, uh, rather three months ago, board, you approved a resolution to urge local school boards and others to lobby Congress to provide more funding for public schools to one, provide PPE, two, make up for lost state revenue in the pandemic, and three, to address catch up growth for our students. Many heeded your call. I'm proud of the many Michiganders who have made their voices heard on the importance of federal funding for the stability of our children's education. Absent congressional action, our children are going to be adversely affected, not simply this year, but for many years to come. Unfortunately, at this point, however, Congress has yet to pass a fifth coronavirus bill into law. I expect that it will, albeit far later than local districts needed or wanted, but there are still significant outstanding questions about the extent, timing and flexibility of the federal aid that local school districts might get in a fifth coronavirus bill. Days, hours, attendance and enrollment. In a pandemic, the way we count days, hours, attendance and enrollment is going to need to differ from the way we have traditionally counted. We typically take for granted these statutory parameters. Many people feel, many parents 
feel uncomfortable and or unwilling to send their children back to school during a pandemic for a range of reasons. Their children's health concerns, parents' health concerns, other family members' health concerns, or a general sense of unease about the current situation. Many of these parents will want their children to continue to be educated by their local school district or public school academy, but at a distance. Moreover, if we fall into phase three or below of the pandemic, we will once again need to educate children at a distance. We must have a system that permits a different form of counting during a pandemic than pre-pandemic. In June board, as you know, the executive directors of seven statewide education associations and I sent a letter to state legislative leadership to recommend the following. The minimum days required annually should remain at 180. Given that some hours of instruction will take place for some students at a distance, that children, particularly young children, shouldn't spend the same number of hours in front of a computer screen as they would spend hours at school, that some students will still not be internet connected and that it will be impossible to track as a result their instructional hours and that we will have to stay home, if you will, if Michigan moves back to phase three or below the state's reopening phases for the pandemic. The requirement to have a minimum of 1,098 hours in the 2020-2021 school year should be waived. Similarly, Given that we will be educating some children at a distance during the entire year as a result of the concerns of parents and that the governor may have to suspend in-person instruction at some point during the school year if our COVID-19 numbers grow, the requirement to count daily attendance in the 2020-2021 school year should be waived. This amendment in state law would also allow districts to shift between an in-person and a remote learning environment without having to meet a 75% daily attendance requirement, the record keeping for which could be very time consuming and difficult, particularly at a distance. And then finally, because of the enormous uncertainty around public health at this time, as well as the lack of clarity about the percentages of children who will be educated at a distance in any school district at any given moment, the enrollment of a local school district for the 2020 2021 school year should be the fall count of the 2019-2020 school year. Parents should certainly be free and feel free to enroll their children where they believe it is best, but the 2020-2021 enrollment count should be the 2019-2020 fall count for revenue purposes to ensure maximum stability for children in school districts at this difficult time. The counts for membership as currently required by law should be suspended for the 2020-2021 school year. The governor and her team and the legislative leaders and their teams have been negotiating these parameters in the last few weeks. The department has shared reflections, both in Senate testimony that I provided a couple of weeks ago and in discussions with the two sides. Some have suggested that it would be better if the governor acted in an executive order to establish days, hours, attendance, and enrollment. It is true that the governor issued Executive Order 2020-35 and Executive Order 2020-65 in the spring to waive the 1,098 minimum number of annual hours and the 75% minimum daily attendance laws. It is also true that the governor extended these waivers in Executive Order 2020-142 issued June 30th through September 30th. As such, at least for the hours and attendance parameters, local school districts have a temporary backstop through September 30th, not sufficient for the year, but helpful for the time being. In spite of the executive orders in the spring, it would be better if the legislature could establish these parameters in collaboration with the governor, with technical support from the Department of Education. The parameters are, after all, statutory parameters. They are a part of state law. Some have suggested that the state superintendent of public instruction should establish these parameters if the legislature is not going to do so or if it isn't going to do so timely. 
The fact is that the state superintendent has no authority to waive attendance or enrollment requirements in current state law and imperfect authority to waive days and hours requirements. To waive days and or hours requirements has benefits, but substantial limitations and potential detriments as well. Most obviously, anything that the state superintendent might do in these areas would still require the state legislature to act on attendance and enrollment. Given that the four parameters, days, hours, attendance, and enrollment are interrelated, it makes best sense for the legislature to address them all cohesively, again, in collaboration with the governor, with support from the department, rather than they be chopped up between and among multiple parties. To do otherwise could adversely affect children and schools, albeit inadvertently. If the state legislature fails to set days, hours, attendance, and enrollment parameters timely, and we begin to approach the sunset of the executive order waiver, I am prepared to use the limited authority accorded me as a constitutional officer, but only after having exhausted all efforts to permit the governor and the legislature to address all parameters together in a mutually acceptable fashion. Assessments. As many of you are aware, MDE applied for and received a waiver last spring from the U.S. Secretary of Education to the federal law requiring state summit of assessments for last school year. MSTEP, MME, and my access for the state of Michigan. MDE recently applied for a waiver for this school year's state summative assessments. The uh, waiver request is pending before the U.S. Secretary of Education as we speak. State summative assessments are enormously time consuming and take a good portion of the spring to complete for elementary and middle schools. Given the need to focus on instruction to the extent possible, state summative assessments should not be the priority in the spring, assuming that children are in school in substantial numbers at the time to take the tests. That said, to begin to get a handle on the aggregate effect of the pandemic on student achievement in Michigan, I am supportive of school districts administering benchmark assessments under the following conditions. And these are locally chosen benchmark assessments under the following conditions. Number one, local school districts should each be able to choose the benchmark assessment that they wish to administer in their individual local districts. Number two, local school districts should make available to MDE the data from the benchmark assessments through the regional data hubs to do statewide aggregate analysis of the data. And number three, local data should be used solely at the local district level for the purposes of improving teaching and learning for children and would not be released statewide, similar to current practice. In other words, our interest is understanding what's happened in aggregate in the state from a student achievement perspective, both with respect to the end of last year and what will have happened during this school year. We're not supportive of state summative assessments in this context. We are supportive of local school districts making available their benchmark assessments for the statewide aggregate analysis. It's up to local school districts to determine if they re release their um, local benchmark assessment uh, data. Educational Equity Fund. In the third federal coronavirus law, the CARES Act, Congress included $13.2 billion for pre-K-12 education in the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund. For Michigan, this amounted to just under $390 million. 90% of the ESSER fund by federal law uh, must be distributed by Title I Part A funding formula. And we've shared this um, with our local school districts. Deputy Superintendent for Finance and Operations, Kyle Garant, has shared this on a few occasions with our local school districts. Uh, many of them have applied for and received approval for their uh, funding applications. Many are in process. Uh, with $37 million of the remainder 
of our ESSER fund allocation to the state. The department established an education equity fund to help districts in particular need address digital divide and mental health needs in their schools. These funds are available on a competitive basis, the application for which was distributed last week. While all districts are invited to apply, districts with 85% or more free or reduced price lunch eligibility, 20% or more special needs children, 10% or more English language learners, or at least one school, 85% or more free or reduced price lunch eligibility will receive priority. We look forward to working with districts to help them narrow the digital divide and help them address some of the mental health concerns that they identify. Board, there's no perfect in a pandemic, but we still have the responsibility to protect, nurture, and educate our children this year, and at the same time, the ability to protect our older and more vulnerable citizens as well. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share a few uh, policy-related updates in this COVID world, um, and I open up the floor to uh, board questions or comments. Uh, Dr. Albrich, a comment. Thank you. Um, someone needs to mute. Okay. I am sorry, I'm hearing feedback. But uh, so, first of all, I want to uh, say thank you for um, those well informed words and uh, for your leadership in calling on a number of legislative fixes that need to happen at least in a temporary basis to ensure that students have the flexibility needed to. Uh, operate in, a, in, in an uncertain time when uh, whether you're face to face or remote, things can change in an instant and we need to have some uh, flexibility in our state laws to allow for that um, to happen. I had one question. Um, first of all, let me just say I completely agree about the uh, summative assessment. I think it makes no sense to have uh, standardized testing at this point. Uh, first of all, most uh, students may not even be in school for standardized testing, uh, and those that are have um, more things to overcome and, and to focus on than to prepare for a uh, standardized test. Finally, if even if they took a standardized test, I don't know how much you can actually glean from that considering the trauma that everyone has been through as a result of this pandemic. However, my question is, uh, you talked about um, schools being able to choose their own benchmark assessment, which I agree is, is a good idea. And certainly I would imagine schools want to be able to do some benchmark testing to be able to see where their students are and where they're headed. However, if they're reporting that data to the state, how does the state make any kind of judgment based on that if everyone's using a different uh, test? How are you able to really glean information from the results of all of those different benchmark tests? Sure, so it's a great question. Um, there are uh, a few um, very frequently used benchmark assessments uh, currently. Um, NWA MAP is used by um, between two thirds and three quarters of the districts in the state. So just analyzing NWA MAP data would be helpful for us. It's not perfect, I concede. Um, there is an inability to um, uh, put data together across benchmark assessments, so you would have to compare them in silos or in buckets, but they would offer us the opportunity to triangulate in our data analysis to look at what's happened with those districts that have done NWA map testing, uh, with STAR testing, with iReady testing, and to draw uh, general conclusions about the uh, effect, the adverse effect of the back uh, third of the year, um, and then by extension, whatever the effect of this coming year will have been on our young people. I think it's important, I don't want to necessarily wallow in this, but I do think it's important to have some understanding of what the adverse impact of the pandemic has been, if only to be able to say these are the effects and we need to address these effects in particular ways. If we're not able to point to clear statistical effects of a pandemic, 
the ability necessarily to advocate for fixes to an uncertain solution um, is going to be diminished. So I would hope that this would help us both instructionally and from the perspective of policy uh, conversation about now what in um, with our legislature, uh, with the governor, with Congress for that matter. Um, this is a this is a generation that is having its education interrupted. And uh, what are we prepared to do about it? And we ought to have some data to understand what the interruption has done. Um, Mr. McMillan. Thank you. But following up on what uh, President Ulbrich just said about the uh, the benchmark testing. So if it's going to be used in some way at the state level, it seems like you're going to be doing comparisons. So you're going to do a second one maybe or because just having it stand alone won't give you any information about good or bad or anything. I mean, if it's a standalone benchmark. And and secondly, um, you know, here um, benchmark tests are not for this purpose. So here's an, you know, we use testing the way it's, uh, you know, it, it's not designed in teacher evaluations. Now we're going to use, you know, benchmarking for some way of determining what's happening to kids during pandemic, which I don't know that it'll actually be useful for that. So I guess that's another concern. And then uh, could you compare that with uh, 59, was it House Bill 5913? I think it talks about these benchmark tests and um, were they gonna be given by indiv individual data to the state? or was it going to be done on a district basis or a school basis? I'm I'm a little leery of giving it anything to the state in this matter. I I think it might be better just to leave it at the at the local level and just make sure that it's maybe done. So I can go back over those questions, Dr. Rice, but that's my first uh, set. I've got two other areas I want to talk about though. OK, very good. Well, I appreciate um, addressing your first set, Mr. McMillan. So a couple a couple three uh, thoughts. One, to give a benchmark assessment in the fall is to permit the comparison with last fall. So you can do a fall to fall comparison of benchmark assessment results and determine minimally what the adverse impact of the spring was of the last uh, school year. Uh, you can compare fall to fall results last year with typical fall to fall results, both within the state and across the country. And with millions of data points nationally, we're going to be able to glean quite a bit um, with respect to the adverse impact of the pandemic. Can, from I, can I just interrupt one second? So, so is the state going to have last fall's benchmark information from each of these districts also then? Yes. Do they already have it? They're available. The question is, uh, they're available to local school districts. We would argue they ought to be available via the regional data hubs uh, to the state for a statewide analysis. So they exist. Benchmark assessments have been administered by local school districts for many years. Um, the benchmark assessments have morphed over a period of years, but so there is an opportunity to do a fall to fall analysis. Okay. Whether there will be the opportunity to do a fall to spring analysis, uh, only time will tell. Um, a fall to spring analysis may fall prey in the same way uh, that a, a state summative analysis falls. We may have trouble with the state summative uh, testing simply because we may not be able to do the state summative test and we may not be able to do a benchmark assessment in the spring, but at a minimum we can do a fall to fall analysis and at a minimum we can discern what happened in the um, in the spring. So that's one thing. The second thing is is that these are assessments uh, as I mentioned, that have been done for many years. Uh, they're by no means perfect assessments. I think a perfect assessment is almost an oxymoron. And it is true that assessments um, have been loaded down with purposes for which they were never intended. Nonetheless, I think the benchmark assessment is a much better vehicle for discerning what has happened to children in, an, in a pandemic then is the state summative assessment. Moreover, benchmark assessments most assuredly are used in teacher evaluations 
across the state. Uh, that is the determination of each local district, but they are absolutely permissible to be used in um, educator evaluations. They aren't required to be used, but they are permitted to be used. And I would argue, and I think most people in the teaching profession would argue, that they're a whole lot fairer to be used in teacher assessments and in, in, in teacher evaluations than our summative assessments. Quite frankly, I'm a little bit leery of using any of these vehicles in teacher evaluations. And my point is not to use these in teacher evaluations. That's not my point. My point rather is to understand at the grossest level, the most aggregate level, the state level, what has happened to our young people so that we're able to determine relatively a path forward, not simply instructionally, which is hugely important, but which is more localized, but from a policy perspective, which is more aggregate and uh, more overarching and at the state level. I concede that it's not a perfect solution, but to my, my final comment, before we went into q and a, I just don't know what perfect in a pandemic is. Okay. So, fifty nine thirteen uh, yeah. is it is it include uh, individual information going to the state or just in bulk? Um, fifty nine thirteen would would have us do an analysis of benchmark data. We are supportive of that. I believe that it would be individualized. We are not supportive of uh, of that. We are not supportive of making individualized data. And and uh, Brandy Johnson is on the line from the governor's office. She's an ex officio member of the board, representing the governor, who is an ex officio member of the uh, board. And and Brandy, if if I misstated that on fifty nine thirteen, could you please correct the record? I don't think you misstated that. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, so, so we are supportive of a portion of 5913. Um, uh, that is to say the benchmark assessments being made available to the department, but not precisely for the same purposes. Ours would be an aggregate analysis. If the local school district wants to release those data, they may. We wouldn't release local data. We would do the aggregate analysis. We would release the aggregate analysis for the purpose of saying, Here's what's happened to our young people. Here's what we recommend needs to take place moving forward. OK, um, thank you, um, uh, Miss Snyder. Well, I'm hold sorry. on. I got I got two more and I think only because I think this is the bulk of the meeting right now is basically this topic. So I don't really feel bad asking a couple other questions uh, regarding the or comments regarding the 2019 20 count being the one that they will get their revenue based on. We talked yesterday about this, Dr. Rice. I understand uh, we don't want to have districts competing with other districts, but it does not. It doesn't settle with me that, you know, it takes away a strong incentive to do well during this time. Um, if, a, if a families, not just district to district, but also many families are dropping out of the system right now and going homeschooling or maybe I mean other other avenues and so I it just I don't know I, I understand that you don't want to um, well that you don't want to have districts competing with others and and uh, having some stability but it's I don't know if we want to give away uh, you know uh, uh, incentive to do well um, in that regard and then Finally, um, we talked also recently about uh, education pods, and maybe there's a misunderstanding what I was talking about, but I think it, it fits well with right now just to quickly say that I, I know there are families that would like to gather several families, like kids from several families, maybe 10 kids at a house that will be working with the kids uh, and, ha and hire somebody to help those kids with their online instruction with their local district. So it's not doing something else. It's just instruction with their local district, but the you know parents have to go to work or whatever. So, um, you know, they want to drop their kids off. They may help pay for that person to help monitor their children. And so I, you know, I just think that, um, and I would encourage the governor's office to consider it and legislators. I've been talking to some legislators because I think, uh, you know, maybe 
and it, you know whether it's put in this uh, edu I, I think it has to do with uh, daycare licensing is what I understand it. That would have to be one of the main changes. And so I don't know if that fits in with some of these education bills, probably not. But if it has to be done through an EO and approved by the legislature under the 76 law, I think that should be done um, post haste to allow maximum flexibility for parents, uh, one income families or uh, or one one parent families or dual income especially. And that's all. Thank you. I appreciate the conversation that we had yesterday on this issue, and I did uh, indicate at that time uh, that I would be following up to get more Thank information. Thank you. Miss um, Snyder and then Miss Fecto. Thank you. I'm happy I um, was able to to join. It kind of made me think about um, what our kids are going to be dealing with, right, uh, as a larger group together in the next year that they've been dealing with, but will continue to, which is issues with connectivity and um, just operating a computer in a remote learning environment or engaging environment. So uh, I worked with DTMB and got on board, so I was grateful for their help. Um, just to shift gears a little bit to access and opportunity, which is what we've talked about from the beginning of the pandemic on a couple different fronts, but also to, to say that the benchmark concept kind of boils over into a, every discussion we have. So are we benchmarking different things related to access and opportunity? So we've talked about internet infrastructure and connectivity, and I know we sent out surveys um, that related to asking parents and school districts about these issues. So what I'd love to have at some point in time this fall is sort of a benchmark survey of how has that changed, hopefully, with some of the CARES Act dollars that we have received and been able to send out to local districts, um, whether it be hotspots or essentially I want to know that that kids are getting access through those dollars that that we're sort of encouraging. Um, and then I would love to have some kind of uh, presentation, whether it's a private or public entity in, that are experts in this area that can talk to us about what our connectivity issues continue to be based on those benchmark surveys with local school districts so that we can make sure that connectivity as a whole doesn't continue to be an issue or is a significant issue even towards the end of the pandemic. So sort of those real time issues dealing with them in real time. And then the second thing is, is the digital divide in terms of like device access. Can we benchmark survey on um, this as well? So I've just sort of been keeping notes in terms of general questions that would be good, I think, to ask local districts. How many more students have experienced um, greater connectivity or acquired a device? And how has the local district partnered with private or public partners to close these gaps? I feel like Maybe if we didn't ask specific questions in the beginning, we should try to make sure that we have asked those or we will ask those so we can benchmark this. Because, you know, as far as access and opportunity goes with remote learning, uh, we don't want to miss that opportunity and then look back and not have asked the basic questions. And I'm not suggesting we haven't or that we won't, but, but just to ensure that we're covering that as we talk about um, access and opportunity for all kids during this time. OK, thank you, Ms. Snyder. Just uh, just a couple of notes on those important uh, access issues. Um, there were sur surveys done um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and the estimates are that approximately 30% uh, of our young people didn't have uh, a device. About 30% didn't have connectivity. There was overlap between the two. It wasn't perfect. Um, overlap, but there was overlap between the two. I believe we've made substantial st strides relative to device divide in the state um, and short term connectivity hotspots uh, provision in the state. I have the exact same interest that you have in understanding in the fall where we are on these two issues. So we will be facilitating surveys in this area to get a better understanding of where we are as a um, as a state. I'd actually like to see a survey done um, near the beginning of the school year uh, once we get school up and running. And then I'd like to see it a few months down the line 
um, somewhere on one side or the other of the winter holidays, because I believe that there will be a couple of more infusions of resources um, over the next several months that could affect those numbers. So we're on the same page. I have an interest in the same in the same thing. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Fecto, uh, a question uh, and or a comment. Okay. Yeah, um, so sorry if I missed this, but um, when you talk about the um, benchmark assessments in the fall, how will they be administered? Well, there, so it's a it's a question um, that we're typically we typically administer those benchmark assessments um, in person in school uh, in the first uh, 30 days. Um, Dr. Kiesler may want to speak to uh, the ability to administer them in a different way. There's some challenges with this. Um, there's no there's no doubt about it. There's some challenges associated with um, diminished data, that is to say um, smaller sample sizes. There are uh, some challenges associated with testing protocols. Um, that said, some data is better than no data. Some analysis is better than no analysis. And even footnoted analysis provides us with some understanding of what's happened to young people in a pandemic. Just a note before I um, pivot to Dr. Kiesler, who's very large on my screen right now um, because she's popped on to the, um, the, the screen as the, the most recent um, visitor to the screen. Um, um, just a, a reflection that these, these benchmark assessments are not ones that we believe should be mandated. We're interested in analyzing the data that's there, not in forcing districts to take what they wouldn't otherwise have taken. Now, I concede that a greater sample size is more helpful and I would love, love all districts to administer benchmark assessments, but if my children are at a distance and they don't have the ability to do those online, I'm a little bit at a loss as to how to make that um, happen, except in the most extraordinarily time-consuming, least logical fashion possible. So Dr. Kiesler, do you have any um, additional short words of wisdom for us? Um, just to add to what Dr. Rice said, um, we have heard, we've done some outreach and we've heard from two of the big benchmark companies, um, iReady and NWEA, or I guess Curriculum Associates is the company that runs iReady and NWEA, that they are preparing to support their schools in administering assessments at a distance. Um, like Dr. Rice said, it's a very different situation. iReady found some things from last spring that were really important. Um, good leadership at the school level, kind of explaining what needed to happen, um, indiv how individual teachers interacted with their students. So that if they prepared them and said, you're going to do a home assessment and here's what to do. Um, really the district communicating with parents about you, if you help your kids, then we, this isn't, you know, you're not helping them. If it's an assessment to understand where they're at and you help them, then we haven't, we basically wasted time. And then just getting the tech right, like did kids know how to use it and things like that. So. Uh, again, the state's not doing this administration, but in talking with some of the companies in the space, they're trying to um, figure out how to support districts who want to do these type of at home assessments of the uh, or administer these assessments at home in a way that has the best fidelity. But to Dr. Rice's point, everybody knows it's not quite the same as doing it in a controlled environment at school. So you have to just take the data with a, a bigger grain of salt than you would normally. Um, and I, I, I support Nikki's thoughts too about, you know, and it sounds like you're doing that, doing an assessment of who has connectivity and who doesn't. Um, will there be special assessments for the, um, for special ed students where we can see if there's gaps there or, f you know, other subgroups like ELL or anything like that? Is there any other special assessment in those areas? Dr. Kiesler? Well, that's a big, sorry, that's a big question. Um, 
the, the how about a brief answer to the big i know <laughs> these products have um, some of them are appropriate for use with students with disabilities and some are not so i think again it would depend on districts working with the whatever their benchmark provider is and using it um, to dr rice's point too some especially some um some of these assessments need to be administered face to face so they won't be appropriate to do at a distance so it's kind of an it depends and i'm happy to follow up with you more or connect okay. more detail because it's again kind of product by product okay. thank and you then I a, a couple of comments if i could please one, yeah one is i um i do support the idea of having the count day suspended and using the um, counts from the past. I have been following closely a number of districts and the deliberations that they're having, and that I think um, really weighs heavy on their decision of whether to go online or not online, or when the issue should really be is the uh, best interest of the students, not in, so the adding the uncertainty of funding and will it detract students? I think it's not necessarily, um, you know, people are, it just creates a, a level of uncertainty that's that's more angst and more, um, I think, interferes with some of these decisions in a way that's not constructive. Uh, so I think having that stability um, and using the the count from from the previous year instead of doing a count this year, uh, I, I would I would strongly support that from my just from my experience in talking to people in different districts. Um, and let's see. Oh, I was just wondering why this we, that why for the pods, why can't that just be done informally um, among people in a community? Why does it have to be legislated? I, I don't understand that. You know, if you people want to get together in the community and ha you know work out babysitting or tutoring or whatever it is, um, and if they're using the district curriculum together and just trying to work together to accomplish um, making sure the students get the support they need in, a, in an informal way. Um, why can't that sort of just be done with, you know, without any sort of formal um, uh, rec legislation or EO? Uh, can I answer that? Briefly. Yeah, briefly. My, I have friends that have um, tried to or wanted to do this and they consulted lawyers. Uh, I don't know that they consulted Lara, but they were told it would be illegal. So, you know, I guess if they're not caught, that's one thing. But uh, and hopefully there'd be a lot of grace given during a, this time. But I, I think that they just wanted to do things. And there's probably other families that would rather not do something that could get them in trouble. OK, thank you very much, President Albrecht and uh, our State Teacher of the Year. Brief comments and then we're pivoting to strategic planning. Yeah, I don't I don't want to belabor the point, um, but I and I understand the desire to want to understand what the impact of uh, COVID has been on education, um, but I I just want to go back. I am very concerned about validity issues and reliability issues with utilizing um, uh, several different locally administered benchmark tests and um, the we have a tendency to make broad conclusions based on data like this that I don't think the, the data was ever meant for. Um, and so I, I just wanna be very hesitant about that and particularly about what we plan to do with this information and how we plan to communicate it because you know, once we communicate out and say, this is what the data is telling us the impact of the COVID has been, that becomes the narrative, even though that was never what it was meant to be and probably is not a reliable or a valid uh, expression of what that data means. So I, I, I guess my question would just be very briefly, and we can certainly continue this conversation um, at some other time, but how are we going to be communicating this in a way that makes it clear that 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 our conclusions are not necessarily set in stone conclusions? Sure, we would um, we would do the analysis by type of benchmark assessment. We wouldn't mix the analyses. Number one, we would heavily footnote the analysis we would have research partners working on it msu u of m um, we would footnote the analysis extensively noting 
the limitations associated therewith, which you do for, for any uh, valid uh, statistical analysis. Um, but we would also be able to say, um, notwithstanding the limitations or with recognition of the limitations, we are able to see that there was an adverse impact of a pandemic in the, um, in the spring of 2020. The reality is if there wasn't an adverse impact um, of a pandemic uh, in the spring of 2020, it really invalidates what we do in public education on a regular basis, right? If we were able to go home and achieve the same results at a distance as we are in schools, it, uh, it in some ways invalidates what we do in schools. I think this is an effort to validate what we do in schools, not to invalidate what took place during the pandemic. It's to raise up the power of public educators in in-person instruction um, rather than to invalidate them in a pandemic. Mr. Bondano, you get the brief benediction. I, I promise I'll be very brief. Um, I just wanted, we're, we're talking about validity and we're talking about um, the grain of salt with which we will need to take the data. And I wanted to, to, to grow that grain of salt a little bit with my perspective from how testing works in my classroom. Um, I have a population of students that traditionally do not perform well on standardized or benchmarked assessments, and they are used to those tests being an indication of their failure. Um, they have a lot of anxiety around that, and many of my students walk into the room having already given up because they, they know that the test is going to show their failures and the ways in which they don't measure up to whatever standard has been set for them. Um, as a teacher, my job is to use my relationship with those students to motivate them, to, to prove to them that they know more than they think they know, and this is their chance to show that. Uh, I think, though, while we are building the plane as we're flying it as virtual instructors, building relationships is going to be one of the hardest things for us to migrate to a virtual environment. So I'm worried that the testing data will look less valid than usual because of students who are demotivated by the setting, by a lack of relationship to their teachers, and allow their generalized testing anxiety and past failures to overcome any idea that they could succeed on it now in this setting. Thank you very much. I think those are all legitimate points. There, there certainly is a body of research that discusses setting and its relationship to, um, to assessment results. Um, again, no perfect in a pandemic. Um, so um, uh, Dr. Pugh notes that she has a comment. Will there be time in the continuity plan discussion? There will be questions and answers uh, during Dr. Strunk's presentation this afternoon about continuity plans. Yes. OK. Um, is that is that sufficient, Dr. Pugh? Yes. OK, all right, thank you very much. Very good. Um, thank you for that rich discussion, board members. We're going to move on now. Um, our next topic is Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan. Today we continue our conversation with the board about the mission, vision, guiding principles, goals and metrics for Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan. Presenters are Ms. Sheila Alice, Chief Deputy Superintendent, and Ms. Kelly Siciliano Carter, Director of Strategic Planning and Implementation. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. We anticipate uh, this conversation uh, lasting between an hour and an hour and a half. Ms. Alice and Ms. Carter, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Good morning, everyone. Mrs. Siciliano Carter and I appreciate the opportunity to once again present on the topic of Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan. Our current top 10 plan was developed under the leadership of the late state superintendent Brian Whiston and approved by the State Board of Education in February of 2016. The plan was created with input from a vast array of stakeholders and partners from across the state. We have been implementing that plan for the past four years. As is a good practice for a learning organization, a strategic plan should be reviewed and updated periodically. With the direction and support from Dr. Rice, we began the process to update the top 10 plan, 
much the same way that former state superintendent Whiston began the process to develop the top 10 plan. And that was to gather input from Michigan's citizens. This past November, we started the review process by conducting interviews with State Board of Education members, MDE staff, and external partners and stakeholders on what should be included in a revised top 10 plan. We completed 48 interviews and focus group sessions. We continued the review process by releasing a survey to Michigan citizens and asked for input on potential goals. We, we received almost 12,000 completed surveys. The data collected from the interviews and the surveys were used to make the recommended modifications to the existing top 10 and 10 plan. One noticeable difference in the recommended components of the revised top 10 plan is the inclusion of metrics. Our current top 10 and 10 plan does not include metrics. We believe that metrics allow us to track and monitor our progress to achieve goals. Today's agenda is a continuation of previous conversations and presentations to review and revise Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan. The most current conversation and presentation occurred during the past two weeks when Dr. Rice, Mrs. Siciliano Carter, Mr. Garant, and I met with two small groups of State Board of Education members to review and discuss proposed metrics for the eight goals. This morning's presentation will provide an overview of the five components that we recommend be included in the revised top 10 plan, as well as a strategy to get statewide commitment and connection to the top 10 plan. During this morning's presentation, you will notice that some text is highlighted in yellow on the slide. The yellow highlighting indicates modifications that were made to the plan based on the comments from board members during the June State Board of Education meeting and comments that were made during the two meetings with small groups of board members that occurred the past two weeks. Once we have completed our presentation this morning, we will then pivot to Dr. Rice, who will facilitate the continued discussion with State Board of Education members on the proposed revisions to the top 10 plan. So let's begin with a review of the recommended five components of the, a revised top 10 plan, starting with the first two components, mission statement and vision statement. As we have shared with the board multiple times, we recommend including the mission statement and the vision statement that are included in the current top 10 and 10 plan. In our revised plan, both of the statements are on the slide. If we could move back a slide, please. Once more, please. There we go, thank you. The mission statement, support learning and learners, is on the slide. We use the word learners in the mission statement when we are referring to all learners in the state. We're referring to learners, both the students as learners and adults as learners. The vision statement is every learner in Michigan's public schools will have an inspiring, engaging, and caring learning environment that fosters creative and critical thinkers who believe in their ability to positively influence Michigan and the world beyond. We believe that both of these statements are meaningful and relevant today, and we recommend that these two st statements be included as is in the revised plan. Moving on to the third component of the revised plan is our guiding principles. In a strategic plan, guiding principles provide a framework and a foundation for the plan. As we have presented to you previously, we are proposing six guiding principles. We created these six principles based on input collected from almost 50 interviews and almost 12,000 completed surveys, where responders also provided us with 2,900 written comments and 5,000 written goals. The six guiding principles being recommended maintain the spirit of our original guiding principles. On this slide, you will see the six guiding principles that we are recommending. Number one listed on the slide. All students have access to high quality instruction, regardless of their gender, ethnicity, race, economic status, native language, or physical, emotional, and cognitive abilities to close the student achievement and opportunity gaps that currently exist. 
the highlighted text that you see at the uh, towards the end of this guiding principle was added as a result of the conversations that occurred among several board members during the June State Board of Education meeting. Second listed guiding principles. All educators are encouraged to be creative and innovative. All educators are adequately compensated and respected for their professionalism and have the resources, support, and training needed to educate students. Third guiding principle. All students are encouraged to express their creativity, have voice in their own learning, feel connected to their schools, and have authentic, meaningful relationships with educators. The highlighted text in this guiding principle was added based on input during the board's small group meeting last week. Fourth guiding principle. All students are provided every opportunity to achieve the broadest range of life dreams. Number five. Families and communities are essential partners of teachers, support staff, and administrators in the education of students. And sixth, in support of students and their achievement, the Michigan Department of Education is coordinated, aligned, and properly resourced, and collaborates with school districts and a wide range of partners and stakeholders. So to recap, we are recommending these six guiding principles which were created based on input from interviews and feedback from surveys, include minor additions based on comments from State Board of Education members, maintain the spirit of the guiding principles in our current top 10 and 10 plan, and will provide a strong foundation for our revised strategic education plan. Goals are the fourth component of the plan. On this slide, we've listed our eight goals. You heard me say during multiple presentations that these proposed goals emerged during the interviews with stakeholders or were ranked as very important based on the survey results which we shared with the board earlier this year. You've also heard me say that it's important that the goals that are approved for inclusion in the state revised strategic education plan are enduring and sustainable regardless of our current circumstances. The goals included in the revised plan should be ones that drive and influence decisions about public education in our state both now and in the future. The eight goals that you see on this slide have remained largely the same over the past six months except for a couple of tweaks. One minor change that occurred since the June Board of Education meeting is the addition of the word early to the Improve Literacy Achievement Goal. This word was added so that this goal more closely aligns with our statewide efforts to improve the literacy of our younger learners. I'm not going to read the eight goals on the slide because um, we will see them um, on the next set of slides when we talk about metrics. So moving on to the fifth component of the plan, which is metrics. We continue to emphasize that metrics are a critically important component of a strategic education plan this is the noticeable missing component in our current plan, and we believe it is essential in a revised plan. Metrics are used to track and compare performances over time. They will help us monitor our progress to achieve each of our goals. So now I'm going to turn the presentation to Mrs. Cis Mrs. Kelly Siciliano Carter, who is going to give us an overview not only of the eight goals, but the metrics that will accompany each of those goals. So Mrs. Carter. Thank you. So as Mrs. Ells just mentioned, I will be presenting the recommended metrics for each of the goal areas. If a potential metric or metrics are unchanged for a goal area since the June State Board of Education meeting, I'll move through that area pretty quickly. However, if metrics have been added or amended, they are highlighted in yellow, as Mrs. Ells mentioned, and I'll provide a bit more context at that time. All right, let's get started. So the first proposed goal that you're seeing on the screen is expand early childhood learning opportunities. This is unchanged for the metrics that we recommended previously. There are three metrics, the number and percent of children served in Great Start Readiness Program, the number of children eligible for the Great Start Readiness Program, and then the near annual yearbook rating for state funded PK programs and near stands for the National Institute for Early Education Research, which is from Rutgers University. We would collect and report as available for all students and all groups of students, which include gender, race, ethnicity, students with disabilities, students without disabilities, English learners and non English learners. 
The next goal is to improve early literacy achievement. And these recommended metrics are unchanged since the last meeting. They are the percent proficient in MSTEP, third grade ELA, the NAEP fourth grade reading, and NAEP stands for the National Assessment of Educational Programs, and then local benchmarks of third grade ELA. Again, we would collect and report as available for all students and all groups of students. The next goal is to improve the health, safety, and wellness of all learners, and there are some changes to these recommended metrics. The first two are unchanged and they are average daily student participation in school breakfast programs. And the next is the percent of students who have on track attendance. The next set of metrics that you see are from the youth risk behavior survey. And based on comments from the board, we have removed two of those which you're seeing crossed out. So I'm gonna walk through each of these um, separately though. So percent of students who are physically active for a total of at least 60 minutes per day on five or more of the past seven days we recommend keeping. The percent of students who played video or computer games or a computer three or more hours per day for something that was not schoolwork we recommend removing. The percent of students who use tobacco product and or electronic vapor products during the past 30 days we recommend keeping. The percent of students who use marijuana during the past 30 days, we recommend removing. The number of students who receive school mental health and support services, we recommend keeping. And we recommend keeping the, the next three as well, which are percent of students who have been bullied on school property in the past 12 months. The percent of students who felt so sad or hopeless almost every day for two or more in a row during the past 12 months. And lastly, the percent of students who seriously, seriously considered attempting suicide during the past 12 months. As I mentioned, this is from the National Youth Risk Behavior Survey. And these questions are all part of that survey, which happens every other year. All right, so the next set of metrics that we would we recommend adding. The top four are from the Behavior Risk Factor Survey. And these are part, um, the survey is from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. It's an annual survey that's run through the telephone. And it's, um, in fact, 2020 survey is the 34th year of the survey. So it's very long, um, it's a very long running survey. And it, the survey is in conjunction with a national survey of the same name under the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So these are four metrics based on those survey questions. So the first is to percent of children ages zero through 17 years who were ever told by a doctor they had asthma. The percent of children ages zero through 17 years who currently have asthma. The percent of children tested for lead and the percent of children tested who had high lead levels and the reason we write data pending behind those last two recommended metrics is that that they are new survey questions in the 2020 survey they haven't asked these questions previously and so it does take two years to get survey data but i know that uh, based on board member conversations in the past these were important metrics to include so they are part of the survey and we would just have to wait to get the baseline data and then the last metrics that we're recommending in this area are related to the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Since 1990, the foundation has ranked states annually on overall child well-being using an index of key indicators. And the Kids Count Index captures what children need most to thrive using four domains. And you're seeing those there. They include economic well-being, education, health, and family and community. Each of the domains then has four indicators for a total of 16, and then the indicators altogether represent the best of data available to measure the status of a child well-being at the state and national levels. So there are definitely some additions based on the feedback from the state board members, both at the June State Board of Education meeting and the small group meetings. So for this um, goal area. The next goal is to expand secondary learning opportunities for all students. On this slide, you're seeing that we have the uh, metrics recommended for certain areas, and none of these are unchanged from the last state board meeting in June. 
So I'm going to quickly walk through these. Under career and technical education, we have the number and percent of students enrolled in a CTE program based on an overall student population. The number and percent of CTE completers based on students enrolled in CTE programs the number and percent of CTE students who received a high school diploma or received a credential. Under advanced placement, we recommend number and percent of students enrolled compared to the total population, the number and percent of tests taken and of students earning credit from AP test. Under international baccalaureate, we recommend number of students enrolled and number of students earning credit from IB tests. And the last was dual enrollment. We have number of students enrolled and the average college credits earned during high school. The next, next set of recommended metrics for this goal have some um, amendments based on feedback from the board members. Under early middle college, unchanged is the, un, the number and percent of students enrolled in an EMC program. The next number and percent of students who successfully obtained their high school diploma and earned at least one of the following EMC outcomes, 60 transferable credits, college credits, an associate's degree, professional certification, Michigan Early Middle College Association certificate, or acceptance into a registered apprenticeship. That did say and, where you see that highlighted, we have changed it to or. And the next metric is new, number and percent of students who enrolled in an EMC program did not complete the program and exited the program to attend college or some other post-secondary education or training. The next metric again is based on uh, feedback and comments from board members and this one was related to both the June State Board of Education meeting and the small group meeting. This isn't underneath one specific area but it's an important one that relates to the entire goal. The number and percent of youth ages 16 and above with an individualized education program or an IEP that meet the necessary federal reporting requirements. What's important with this metric is it's relating to secondary transitions and in order to meet the required um, reporting for the feds is that you would have to have secondary transition plan and it would have to have certain components within that plan. So that is that this is an additional metric we're recommending. And then where we could, we would collect and report as available for all students and all groups of students. Okay, the next goal, increasing the percentage of all students who graduate from high school. This is unchanged. This is four, five, and six year graduation rates would be the recommended metric. The next goal is to increase the percentage of adults with the post-secondary credential. Recommended metric is unchanged, which is the number of adults with a certificate or degree. The next goal does have some um, amendments and additions. The goal is to increase the number of certified teacher in areas of shortage. We recommend the number of endorsements in the critical shortage areas, number of positions filled by appropriately certified educators assigned to subject areas listed within the critical shortage list, the retention rate of appropriately certified educators assigned to subject areas listed within the critical shortage list, the number of positions on the critical shortage list that are reported as vacant, and then one that's been unchanged, percent of teachers by ethnicity compared to percent of students by ethnicity. So you note there's a footnote on the second and fourth metric, and we wanted to make sure to highlight that these data are undergoing a shift in reporting standards which may result in a change of trends. We wanted to make sure and highlight that. And then the last goal is to provide adequate and equitable funding. These are all new metrics and they hopefully provide a good snapshot on where there's gaps and opportunities. So there, the first one is, is there a weighted formula for poverty? Yes or no? Does the weighted formula match the school finance research collaborative report recommendation? Yes or no. And then what is the difference between the current funding formula and the SFRC recommendation? And for the next three, it's similar. It just changes that where it is. It was poverty for the first. The second is for English learners. The third is for students with disabilities. The next is career and technical education. And then a little bit different. The 
The next one is recommending, is there a dedicated funding amount per child for the Great Start Readiness Program? Yes or no? Does the dedicated funding amount match the SFRC recommendation? And then the next one is related to transportation. And then does the state provide funding for transportation? Yes or no? And does the funding for transportation match the FS SFRC recommendation? If not, what's the difference? So that concludes all the information I have for you related to metrics. And so I'm going to pivot that discussion back to Dr. Rice or Mrs. Alice, if there was anything you need to summarize beforehand. Thank you, Kelly. And that will be to me. I appreciate that. Our final topic this morning is contributions. We heard um, both Dr. Rice and me talk about the number of expected outcomes from our revised top 10 plan. And one of those expected outcomes is for there to be an improved understanding of the plan and an expanded support of it. Um, one of the ways that we can achieve this outcome is by making Michigan's revised top 10 plan a collective document, one where districts see their contributions and their connections and their role in its implementation. Once the board approves a, the revised top 10 plan, the plan becomes Michigan's strategic education plan. We want the plan to be viewed as a living or dynamic plan where ISDs and local districts, organizations, colleges and universities, businesses, they all see their role in helping implement the plan and contributing to the achievement of its goals. We know that there are many, many wonderful and exciting efforts occurring in the 831 districts in our state, and we want districts to be able to share their successes and best practices. So the department will provide an online platform where districts can post their efforts or their contributions to support the implementation of the top 10 plan. So think about the online platform as an electronic bulletin board of contributions where districts can post their strategies, initiatives, and best practices that they are using to implement each of the goals. This will provide districts a venue to highlight the great things that they are doing in their district to implement the goals and an opportunity for these strategies, initiatives, and efforts to be viewed and replicated by others. Districts can use the collection of contributions when looking for ideas to support a goal. For example, if there's a district that's looking for new ideas on how to expand its secondary programs, it could visit the goal, expand secondary learning opportunities for all students on this platform for a list of contributions posted by other districts. Districts can then choose the strategies that best meet their needs and replicate them in their district. And the department will play a role in implementing the revised plan as well by supporting districts with their implementation, providing guidance to districts on ideas that they may have, and being a resource for districts. The role of MDE that I just described is reflected in the sixth guiding principle. So this concludes the formal presentation on the recommended revisions to the top 10 strategic education plan. And Dr. Rice, I'm going to turn the presentation back to you for additional comments and also to engage the board in continued discussion on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Alice, Ms. Carter, for your presentation, your work over the last several months on this enormous effort. Um, we have a question from Ms. Snyder. I just, I wanted to go back to the slide that talked about ranking <clears throat> families and community. Can you describe to me what that looks like? So we're, we're essentially applying a metric to a student according to their family and community rank. Can you describe that? I so, think you're referring to the Annie E. Casey Annie Kids e. Casey. Count um, Foundation uh, uh, ranks. Uh, Ms. Alice, if you would please uh, share that. Um, if you can pull the, uh, thank you. And Kelly? Yes. Kelly, can you speak to um, each of the um, rankings? Um, yes. And, and once again, reiterate how Michigan's national rank is um, tabulated, calculated? Absolutely. Thank and, you for that and, question. And also describe within each of those four categories, the subcategories. Okay, it sounds great. So there is a there is a ranking for the state overall, which is the Michigan's national rank for overall child well-being, and they base that ranking on the items that you see below that. 
So the economic, education, health, and family and community. And then within each of those, there are sub um, groups. So I'll go through those now, what each of those are. So underneath of economic well-being, there, there is data around children in poverty, children whose parents lack secure employment, children living in households with a high housing cost burden, and then teens not in school and not working. So those are the four indicators they're using for the economic well-being item. The next one is related to education. They have young children ages three and four not in school, fourth graders not proficient in reading, eighth graders not proficient in math, high school students not graduating on time. Those are the four indicators for that, um, that item. For health, it's low birth weight babies, children without health insurance, child and teen deaths per 100,000, and then children and teen ages 10 to 17 who are overweight or obese, okay? And then the last under family and community, the four items are children in single parent families, children in families where the household head lacks a high school diploma, children living, living in high poverty rate, or I'm sorry, children living in high poverty areas, and then teen births per 1,000. So each of the four roll up and you get a ranking for each of those sub items and then all four, all 16 roll up for the national ranking. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Um, other, um, other questions of board members, questions or comments of board members. Uh, Dr. Pritchett, a question. I believe Owen may have a question ahead of me. Okay, um, Owen Bondano, question. Um, I'm, it may be more of a comment, but um, in looking at the guiding principles, that the six that were presented near the beginning of that, which I love them, uh, the first guiding principle was sort of a, essentially a non-discrimination policy. And so I wondered if there was a reason that sexual orientation and gender identity were not listed amongst the protected identities in the first of the guiding principles. Ms. Alice. Thank, thank you for um, asking that question, Owen. Um, when I'm looking at this uh, guiding principle and I'm seeing the word gender, that leads me to um, also gender identity. So it's make, ensuring that all students have um, high quality educational experiences, um, regardless of their gender or their gender identity. In some places, the court has backed up the interpretation of gender, but in other places it has not. So I just wonder, also, you know, we, we don't generally think about sexual orientation for students because they're minors, but I can tell you that my, my class and my high school students are affected by discrimination based on sexual orientation. So I just wondered if there was a way to include those or if there was a reason they were not included. Um, Owen, there isn't a reason why they weren't include, included. I mean, if that is the will of the board, then we certainly will include that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pritchett and then Ms. Fecto. Um, you may have uh, covered this and I missed it. Um, now that we are to this point with the st uh, strategic plan, and I appreciate all the work that uh, staff have uh, done um, with this, uh, is it going back out for, and I know we've gotten lots of feedback ahead of time with small groups and surveys etc is it now going back out for public comment now that it is in a document form like this just um, a question more of a procedural question uh, we've been developing this in public for the last three quarters of a year month by month piece by piece item by item um, with public comment available uh, from January through August, the intent was not to uh, resend it out because it was never in per se. It was always out um, publicly for display, for comment. 
uh, we began this process, as you may recall, with 12,000 surveys of people um, with four dozen interviews and the like. And we've worked with the board in public session to uh, review the, the different elements. Uh, Ms. Fecto. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I want to uh, strongly support the um, amendment that Owen just suggested and um, another reason why I'm glad he's on the board. Um, I think um, explicitly including um, sexual orientation or LGBT status is um, is important and I and I would support that strongly. Um, the other, uh, I just wanted to make a comment with regard to um, for the record that the when we talk about disabilities that the department is going to try as uh, best as the information is available to distinguish between um, different disabilities, um, cognitive, um, intellectual, um, uh, uh, and developmental or physical disabilities because there are some programs that um, I have found um, don't that you know they if there's behavioral issues or uh, uh, other disabilities that they that there's certain groups that get excluded more than other groups um, when it comes to disabilities so that that I just for the record I know that you're going to do it I just wanted to make a public statement to that um, finally um, I think I uh, otherwise I think the I, I really support the, the strategic plan I am um, I think the efforts to try to prioritize and develop metrics is is absolutely uh, important and appreciate all your efforts and your leadership. Um, uh, Superintendent Rice, I think though at some point, maybe in the spring, we can look or maybe if it'll after that, but look at the uh, data that we collect and start to think about where we want to go from there. How much do we want to improve, you know, given our given the situation we're in, you know, taking into consideration the COVID and where we are with that, but where we want to go and um, having discussions about, um, you know, ex you know, for lack of a better term, sorry, targets um, or general targets, a range of whatever. But, but I think at some point, not now, but once we have this initial data, exactly what do we want to do to improve upon it? So I'm just suggesting that for the future and perhaps maybe next summer, I won't be here, but um, or the um, the strategic planning might be a good time to have a discussion about where do we want to go moving forward. So those are my my comments. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Fecto. Uh, Mr. McMillan. Um, thank you. I we had talked uh, at the I guess it was at the um, group board meeting last week uh, and I wanted to just interject again that um, you know the first guiding principle I am concerned to a degree uh, that when we focus on what we determine as student achievement gaps it's usually based on high stakes testing and a lot of times um, that can create creativity gaps where we're focused on things uh, that we measure and we don't focus on things that are harder to measure. So um, I am concerned uh, about that. Um, and then to uh, to add to what um, Nikki was talking uh, talking about, you know, some of these metrics. You know, I, I um, if we're going to include metrics, I'm assuming that we're going to want to do something about them. I mean, the question would go. Well, you guys are you folks are measuring these and they're low or their trend is bad. So what are you going to do to make the trend good? I assume that's why you would do metrics. You wouldn't just. Gather metrics and, and use them. Um, and and not have, you know, I guess if they're if you're judged to be something you want to measure, you probably want to improve them um, or change them in some direction. And so you know, are we going to get into the uh, coming up with ways to reduce poverty? Are we going to try to figure out ways to uh, increase birth weight? Um, you know, are, there, are these things that are going to become, uh, you know, the board's uh, focus uh, because we're measuring them? I'm assuming that we want to improve them if we're measuring them. So 
and then and then also what I mentioned with uh, like school breakfast programs, you know, it would be best if that number was really low. If kids didn't need school breakfast programs, uh, if they actually got them at home. So, you know, saying I don't know if our goal is to increase that or is it to decrease that number? I guess to some degree, same with the GSRP. If we if it's deemed that kids are ready to come into school and that number gets lower, maybe that's a good thing. Um, and so, you know, some of these, I'm just not exactly sure how they're going to be used. Um, intentions can be one thing when we approve them, but I don't know how they'll be used next year or in coming years. Um, I have expressed, um, yeah, some concerns about some of these uh, health, safety, and wellness metrics and how we're going to measure them and, and, and why exactly if we're not going to get into the business of trying to uh, improve them. In, in regard to AP, I mean, I, I'm glad we're going to, we're looking at earned credit because a lot of, there are people who have done studies, I believe, I think back in June, I brought up one where it actually can be harmful to push kids, students into taking AP that are not, it's not, you know, it could be something that is um, not useful for them. They could be, it could be a better, you know, their opportunity cost could be better used somewhere else if they are not getting the credits. Um, I've expressed some concerns about IB as well and its origins and, um, and control um, and what exactly it's uh, promoting. Um, same with AP because I think the College Board uh, decides what's going to be in uh, a lot of those classes or what the test is, therefore the curriculum that will be teaching to the test. So at any rate, I, there's a, a plethora of concerns I have um, and I just wanted to uh, be able to voice those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Would you like uh, would you like any feedback associated with that or would you uh, prefer just to um, That's up, let you, it's up let to you. I mean, we, on the we talked a little bit about it, but if you want to. Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, I certainly especially when we're talking about metrics and these wellness and what exactly the purpose of reporting them if we're not going to try to change them sure. as a board? So um, all metrics are not created equal. Uh, they do not all have the same purpose. Some of them are descriptive metrics. Some of them are metrics for the purpose of uh, determining or showing progress. Um, there are many metrics um, that are directional. Every metric is not directional. Um, for example, um, were we to have a metric on um, reporting uh, on, um, on crime, um, that would not necessarily be directional. It would appear to be directional, but it's not because in fact your numbers could move because of better reporting of the same phenomenon or they could move because crime has increased or decreased. With respect to breakfasts, um, the way in which we fund uh, free breakfasts in uh, the state and across the country permits us to aggregate uh, groups of young people and permits all groups of young people, irrespective of whether they are free or reduced price lunch eligible, to get free breakfasts in schools under particular conditions. And a number of us believe that given um, the scramble, in particular families, that there is a value for young people eating at school because they often don't eat at home before they go to school. So this is a metric ensuring us that uh, young people have eaten to begin the day. Ideally, every child would have a wonderful breakfast at home um, in his or her family, but the reality is, is that that's not our world. And so we try to provide some measure of sustenance um, to our young people so that they are able to function uh, well in a classroom during the morning. I myself had a struggle with this as a local school superintendent, having to decide whether to move to a universal breakfast program or not. I ultimately determined that we would do so. It was at the expense of a little bit of instructional time 
but we felt we got an enormous amount more out of the young people when they were fed than when we simply relied upon and hoped for the feeding of young people at home. So that's a marbled metric. It doesn't necessarily tell you that you are progressing or not with higher or lower numbers, but it does give you a little bit of a sense of the extent to which the breakfast program is used in local districts. The ability to uh, tease out um, free or reduced price lunch eligible young people getting breakfast as opposed to non is a little bit challenging in a universal breakfast program. There are enormous numbers of nuances associated with this. Happy to get Dr. Diane Golzinski, our director of the Office of Health and Nutrition Services to share that with you. But suffice it to say that unlike many metrics, the free and reduced price lunch, um, not the free and reduced price lunch metric, but rather the, the breakfast metric is not so much a directional metric as a general descriptive metric. Here's where we are in terms of the provision of breakfasts to our young people. In general, the metrics are efforts to paint pictures. We're trying to move the eight goal areas. There are a number of different ways to look at each of the eight goal areas. There's a very limited reliance of testing um, in the metrics associated with the goal areas. You point out literacy, which is a legitimate uh, noting, but the other seven don't have an enormous amount of testing associated therewith. And with respect to literacy, I did ask you if you had any other thoughts as to how we might determine progress in literacy in the absence of assessments. And I don't recall you offering any suggestion um, to add to that. Happy to consider an addition to that. I'm a little bit at a loss as to how you track improvement in literacy without assessing young people. What we've done, however, is to triangulate. What we've done is we've looked at um, each of these goal areas and attempted to have multiple metrics. So multiple ways of looking at whether we are improving in the metric or not to the literacy point to which you uh, referred or the literacy metric. Um, you have NAEP, you have MSTEP, you have the benchmark assessments. And again, it's the only one that has a significant reliance on um, assessments. The other have light or no reliance on assessments. To your question about health, safety, and wellness, uh, we think this is an important broad goal. I might add, not only do we, but the survey results of 12,000 people in the, um, in the early winter indicated the same thing. The board for months has said, so we've changed some of those metrics. We've deleted two of the metrics. We've added a couple of uh, metrics, all at the suggestion of the board. Um, it is true that different metrics have uh, different purposes. The um, kids count metrics permit us to compare across states. Um, the um, youth survey metrics and the parent survey metrics permit us to get a sense longitudinally of where we are in the state. In some cases, yes, we are trying to improve results in those metrics. In the case of uh, uh, percentage of children free or reduced price lunch eligible, I would argue that um, it's not a direct focus of the State Department of Education. However, the better that we do in public education over the long term, the better we're going to do with respect to poverty in the state in the long term. It's not to say that we are going to move poverty in the short run in a strategic plan, but midterm, long term, if we educate children better, they will do better in life and they will be less likely to be adversely affected by poverty. It won't fully immunize them from poverty, but it will give them some measure of immunization, if you will, or inoculation from poverty. So those are a few brief thoughts to, um, to, your, to your comments. Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Um, again, 
a lot of work has gone into this and I appreciate that, but as with any plan like this, um, and I think it go, it, it's assumed, but I just wanted to say it, make a comment about the fact that we will be revisiting it. So your point is well taken on the uh, metrics, for example, for the early literacy. Um, right now, they are heavy on standardized assessments. That's not to say that once we are through this pandemic and the possibility of being able to uh, get some benchmark data or possibly some other uh, data from teachers in the classroom, because especially in early literacy, that is so important. Teacher observation, uh, changes they can see with their students within weeks, sometimes months um, uh, at the early uh, grades uh, will inform us better in helping districts as they continue to build literacy into the upper grades. So um, again, I just wanted to make that comment. I think it goes it's assumed, but just to remind everybody, this is not something we're going to put on a shelf and maybe someday take a look at it again and go, oh, gee, what were we thinking then? Thank you. Well, Dr. Pritchett, to your point, um, running records are enormously important for the tracking of early literacy uh, progress. They're hard to roll up into any sort of um, global analysis. But granularly, they're hugely important for determining how well Mikey is doing in his kindergarten classroom and his emerging um, literacy. Uh, we do want this not to be two dimensional. We do want it to be three dimensional. We don't want it to be a dead document, but a living document. We want it annually reviewed and we expect that it will be annually reviewed. That is to say that we will um, each year report on where we are on the gestalt on the whole and that uh, month by month we'll bring forward an individual goal area and dig into that individual goal, goal area and talk about the efforts that we're, um, we're working on to address the teacher shortage, not simply within the department, but across the state and what the metrics show, how we're doing in terms of adequate and equitable school funding, how we're doing in terms of early childhood, early literacy, health, safety and wellness, secondary school programming, uh, graduation rates, and then post-secondary credential um, rates of attainment as um, well. And then the only other thing that I, that I want to share with respect to a living document is, Ms. Alice noted the importance of the contributions. We want local school districts to say to us, we have a best practice of which we are proud. We have a best practice that's really driving literacy achievement we want to include this as a link under literacy that can be something from which other districts can learn and that first district can learn from other districts on other um, uh, contributions so we do want it to be not a static document but a um, but very much an organic living breathing document thank you for sharing that um, dr pew and then uh, Ms. snyder And I apologize, I missed part of the presentation. I was uh, knocked out of the uh, meeting again, but so I, sorry if I, what I missed out on, but I, I did hear uh, board member Fechtaw and Dr. Pritchett's comments. And I do, you know, I first want to say that it is good that we have this opportunity to continue to critique the plan uh, and the goals because we know we're in such a fluid time and uh, number one, people's attentions are are all over the uh, attention is all uh, over the place, uh, as well as uh, the fact that uh, we're going to learn so much more after going through what it is that we're going through. And so, being able to constantly critique, look at the plan uh, from that viewpoint. And I just want to commend the department for putting uh, so much emphasis on the health of children. I, you know, as being a person from public health, I know that you cannot decouple uh, the, the academic success and outcome of children from their health, their their environments, their health uh, and well-being. They're so linked and the data shows that. And so for us to be able to start uh, thinking about that, the folk, you know, those of us in the public health realm uh, think of, call this, uh, this uh, effort uh, health in all policy. 
So making sure that, that we're looking at the health, uh, health indicators to predict uh, as well as monitor uh, how children are performing uh, in in uh, schools, and you know, to 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 board member uh, McMillan, we say all the time that children are not just test scores, and so this helps us to be able to to make input, uh to be able to begin to to dig in and see uh, what are um, what are some of the factors that the upstream factors that influence test scores, whether we're talking about uh, asthma. We know that asthma uh, has said to be and is shown to be for years, uh, if not the a leading cause of, of, of absenteeism, the leading cause of absenteeism. And so we could go on and on about the indicators and we have the research to back that. And so I really just want to commend the department uh, for making that leap forward. Uh, in this time that we're in, we see how important the link is. If we didn't see it with the Flint water crisis, uh, those of us who are in the public health realm have seen this for, for so long. Uh, the other piece I just wanted uh, to mention, and I, I want to welcome our new teacher of the year, uh, as well as thank uh, uh, our former teacher of the year for all of her efforts. I didn't get to do that this morning, but um, you know, I just want to make sure that that when we're talking about learners and I and I heard that, but just making sure that that we know that we care about the educators, the folks who are directly uh, responsible in these classrooms for the learners and the learning of the learners. Uh, so, um, you know, though for me, it wasn't spelled out um, and I think it has been explained that we that we are talking about our educators, our teachers, uh, as well as having some um, guiding principles that speak to that as well, or a guiding principle that speaks to that as well. Okay, thank you, Dr. Pugh. Uh, Ms. Snyder. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say uh, a few different things on different levels. Um, but first, kudos to the collaborative platform uh, concept where we're highlighting local districts that are taking on various aspects of remote or virtual learning in a way that's independent and pretty creative. Because um, some districts are going to be uh, more successful in some areas than others. And so coming together and kind of sharing that information and those successes and um, for districts that are, you know, need suggestions, if you will, just that collaborative platform is really a positive thing. So I think that's definitely something that should be fused into any uh, plan of action. Um, some of these goals I think are good goals. I'm not suggesting they're not worthy of discussing, um, but there is a significant sense I have um, and have had for the last week or so that this kind of strategic plan is not appropriate for where our educational system is actually at. Um, I think even with a commitment to revisiting this plan, um, the questions of is it the right time? Is it the right focus? If parents are tuning in, I just imagine that they might be thinking, how does this apply to my kids or our students right now? Um, they might be asking, several other questions like is my school even going to start will i have access to in-person learning or appropriate guidance given the difficulty with access to remote learning um i thought something owen said that was very interesting and, and positive but in a demotivated setting right so um to some degree we have hundreds of thousands of students that will probably not be motivated in this setting and they're and they're going into the school year and that's at the top of the list of the discussion that they want to hear us having um, and setting goals around. So what are we doing to increase opportunity and access to remote learning? We talked about that in the beginning. What kind of help are local districts looking for in support of these exact issues, not necessarily broader goals, if you will? Um, are the districts that are looking for help getting help? And, and I'm not suggesting we're not doing that, but just the discussion, the time that we spend reflecting and discussing and setting goals that it would be surrounding these types of um, this type of conversation. Um, the, the sense that I have regularly, it, it may sound um, doom and gloom, but it, it's just, I think, real time and reality that there's an unprecedented educational gap that's growing. 
I feel very strongly that that needs to be acknowledged and said out loud. I think it's significant. I think that our conversation should be focused on, on goals that address that and address these issues more immediately and for all kids, all kids. Uh, Michael, I know we had a lively discussion yesterday. I'm sure you will have a response to this. So I want to be clear, a uh, no vote on this strategic plan isn't disengagement from some of these goals, but it's a strong statement about the educational gap that we will reflect back on in the coming years and in the discussions I think we need to be having now and focused on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, other board members? Other board member comments or questions? Comments or questions from board members? Board, you have a, um, a strategic plan uh, currently that is aspirational. Um, it was put into place in 2016. Um, it's um, been helpful in a number of different ways. The draft strategic plan that you have been working on for the last three quarters of a year is a strategic plan that is uh, that has goals which are more operationalizable. They are enduring goals. They're goals pre-pandemic, during a pandemic, uh, after a pandemic. We need to improve, uh, increase the number of children having early childhood education in the state. And we need to track whether we're doing that. We need to improve literacy, whether we're in a pandemic or not. We need to improve health, safety, and wellness. If a pandemic teaches us anything, uh, it's that. We need to um, address secondary school programming. We need to improve high school graduation rates and post-secondary credential rates. Um, we need to address a teacher shortage, irrespective of whether we're in a pandemic or not. And if we ever wondered whether school funding was important, uh, we certainly know it when looking at the diminution of revenue in the midst of a pandemic, the need to buy PPE in the midst of a pandemic, the need to spend money to address catch-up growth in a pandemic. Your current strategic plan has no metrics. Uh, it has no way uh, by extension of uh, looking at gaps through the strategic plan. Um, this is a draft strategic plan that has metrics and permits you to look at gaps. Um, you've all in one way, shape or form talked about gaps, but this provides a vehicle for looking at those gaps in a much more systematic way. It also provides the state board with an opportunity to lead in the development of goals, in the development of metrics associated with those goals, in the creation of a vehicle for contributions from local school districts, 831 of them in a local control state to those goals. What are we trying to do with our children on an enduring basis, whether we're in a pandemic or not? These goals are right on top of what we're trying to do with children. And um, they are relevant uh, pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, uh, post-pandemic. So I share that um, with you for your um, for your reflection. Um, I believe that this is a plan that will be relevant for a period of years, and it will be even more so if we keep it fresh and keep it alive and continue to morph it as need be over a period of years. Uh, President Albrich. Uh, thank you. Sorry, um, Teams was giving me some weird message. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, I, I think this is a great conversation and I really appreciate everybody adding um, their perspective. Uh, I can tell you, for some reason, can you can hear me, correct? Yes. Um, my my team's is messing up right now. So 
Uh, I don't know if you can see me, but you can hear me. Um, so, so in in my in multiple realms of my life, um, I was in the process of doing strategic planning pre-pandemic. Then the pandemic hit, and all of that strategic planning, whether it's the state board of education, my career, etc., took a pause. And now we're at the part where we are getting back to strategic planning because the reality is this is an ongoing process that can't stop. Um, it's a long term process uh, and it, it needs to as such, it needs to take into uh, account changing circumstances, but it's it's not something that we can hold off indefinitely uh, because we have to know what direction we're heading and we have to give uh, this, we have to be leaders and provide our, our districts uh, some leadership on the direction to help them as they're going through their planning as well. I, I just want to reiterate the fact that this has been a very long process and multiple voices have been included in this process. Uh, almost 12,000 surveys were completed across the state four dozen interviews of organizational leaders in education, business, philanthropy, and government, uh, you know, focus groups, more surveys, MDE staff. The State Board of Education has been part of this conversation for months. Um, Dr. Rice has reached out to each one of us on multiple occasions to get our feedback and our input. We've had open meetings, we've had special meetings. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the document that you're going to that you see is not going to be perfect and it never is because anything that incorporates that many voices and that many uh, responses is not going to please everybody um, and it it may leave some things out that we want. It may include some things that we don't think is necessarily important, although however, some people may find them important. Um, but I would just challenge my fellow board members after this entire process. If you're still not happy with the document you see, offer suggestions. It's not enough just to say, well, I don't feel right or I, I'm not quite sure that this is the right direction. We all have the opportunity to offer specific requests. I've done it and I'm happy to say that some of the things that I've suggested have made it into the document. I'm also going to say some of the things I've suggested haven't made it into the document, but that's part of the process. Um, so I would just challenge you if you're not happy with what you're seeing. Let's bring some specific things to the table that we can mull over, um, but I, I think we need to be we need to be a little more respectful of the process that we've gone through here because it's been an extremely inclusive process. Um, and and I do think that uh, that you we need to have a strategic plan, um, especially now. I, I understand the the argument that now might not be the right time because it is a sensitive time and, and it is a time when a lot of districts are, are grappling with really serious issues and decisions and there's consequences to all of them, but there's always going to be consequences. And if we're not providing direction, then I don't feel like we're doing our job. So I'm just going to say I think that at some point we have to make a decision recognizing that this is a living document and nothing is going to be set in stone the, the day we make a, a decision or we have a vote. But at some point we need to move forward. Um, so that's it. That's all I need to say. Thank you very much, um, President Albrich, uh, Dr. Pugh. And uh, then, a, then a note from just a note from Ms. Fecto. Uh, we see you, Cassandra. So, yeah. just uh, Dr. Dr. Pugh, um, to to you. Yes, Cassandra, we see you, uh, President Dr. Albrich, and we hear you loud and clear. And uh, you know, I just want to you know ditto uh, everything that, that uh, Dr. Albrich just said. But I do, you know, just want to back up and support uh, some of the things that Nikki said because uh, I don't know how long, um, Dr. Rice, you and I, you had an opportunity to talk to me and help me to understand 
you know, that even though the data was collected, the survey information was collected pre-pandemic, that these things that are in our strategic plan, those, those are just, those are pillars. But, but we all also will have this opportunity to continue to, to get input. Um, I do think that we're in a place now, a fluid place where things, we may learn things that, that we did not know, but at the same time, uh, that's what strategic planning is. We have to make sure that we're moving forward, moving the state forward and our children and educators uh, forward, uh, uh, regardless of, of where we are right now, but at the same time, making sure that we are not tone deaf and that we are in tune to, um, to what's going on and have that opportunity to do that. But um, after much conversation and this conversation and the presentation, um, I'm, I'm good with us uh, take, having the vote uh, and, and moving forward with this, but I just wanted to uh, back up and support some of the things uh, and make sure that Nikki knows that these are concerns that, as Dr. Albert said, I have, she has, others have thought through. So um, just wanted to mention that. Thank you very much, Dr. Pugh. Uh, Ms. Ramos Montini. Well, good afternoon. It's already 1, no, 12.08. But I am very impressed with the work that, uh, and the leadership that uh, Sheila and uh, Kelly have put into this document. I cannot help but uh, think of, of our late superintendent, Brian Whiston, and when he uh, proposed uh, this document, and and I cannot help but see and admire the progress of the document. I love when when Dr. Um, Rice says that it's a living document. Uh, I like the collaborative spirit that uh, is being enhanced as they renewed and updated uh, the many comments and and the recommendations that we had as a board and uh, so with that I I am ready to vote I am ready to make the motion so this living document lands in everybody's corner of the educational world and uh, we could uh, we start working on some of these uh, new metrics the metrics part of the document is, is very powerful and it makes the document so much uh, more uh, conducive to, um, to usage. I concur with everything that has been said and I, I, uh, I hear your concerns, uh, but this document has been put through the ringer many, many, many different times and I think it's ready for a vote. Okay, um, I will take that as a, uh, a motion to approve. Um, do we have a second? This is Judy, second. Uh, Dr. Pritchett, um, second. So Ms. Ramos Montini, a motion. Uh, Dr. Pritchett, a second. Comments associated there with. Comments associated there with. Uh, comment by Mr. McMillan. Yeah, I there are certainly good things in this document, uh, but I have expressed some concerns. Um, I don't think it's probably unusual that the minority party has some differences. Um, and, um, you know, I think this document would look different if we had a majority Republican, uh, somewhat different, maybe not a lot, but there might be uh, some. So I, I don't, uh, want this to be viewed as uh, overly critical. I just, there, there are areas that I would, uh, that I've already expressed and some that I haven't, that I would just uh, not have and, and maybe insert others, probably just remove some. I don't know that, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Okay, fair, fair enough. Um, Ms. Fecto, a comment. Um, yeah, the only thing I, if, if um, you know, to Owen's point about the LGBT, uh, and uh, I know that um, 
Dr. Alice had said that gender includes that. I just wonder if there was some way to, um, uh, if not put it in the text, to highlight somewhere, or asterisk or somewhere, that it includes this group as well. Um, Dr. Like Rice, I'd be, I'd be happy to respond. Um, uh, thank you, Ms. Alice. Um, we will look for um, either in the guiding principles um, or somewhere in the plan where we can reflect um, sexual orientation. Okay. As Owen had recommended and as you supported, and I see um, um, Dr. Albrich nodding her head, so we've got multiple board members supporting. So um, we will find a, a place in the guiding principles or somewhere in the plan to make it explicitly um, included. Thank you. Thank you. Following the parliamentary procedure, is it uh, a friendly amendment to to the uh, motion? Uh, you, you'd like you'd like that to be offered as a friendly amendment. Correct. Okay. okay. I offered as a friendly amendment. <laughs> Except. Uh, okay. All right. There, there, you, there you go. It's good to have friends. And Dr. Um, do you accept the friendly yes. amendment? Yes. Okay. There we right. go. So that's a that was a uh, that was a legislative kumbaya moment. Okay. Um, that's a uh, that's a good thing. Um, that was Ms. Fecto, uh, Dr. Albrich, to you. Oh, I was just going to say I agree with Michelle Fecto. Okay. Oh, addressed it, so we're good. Very good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Any other comments or uh, questions? Uh, insertions, fears, phobias. I think we uh, need to vote on the on the friendly amendment. Um, Actually, no. If, if the motion maker accepts in the seconder, then it doesn't have to be voted on. Sweet. Our parliamentarian has ruled. Uh, That's just how the friendly amendments work. <laughs> and uh, we we have a, um, a a friendly amendment and a friendly parliamentarian, a friendly mover and a uh, a friendly shaker as a seconder. Um, thank you very very much. Any um, any other comments? Hearing none. If uh, uh, we could um, see if that there is any public comment uh, for us. Anybody to offer public comment on this at this time? This is this is Marilyn. I have received three requests for public comment. They have told me what they're going to speak on um, after the lunch hour during the normal time. One has indicated that their comments involved this topic. OK, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, that then we will um, hold the other public comments in abeyance for the regular um, public comment time, but just wanted to pulse and see if anybody was out there waiting to speak to us on the strategic plan itself. Hearing and seeing none, Marilyn, if you could take a roll call vote on the motion of Ms. ramos Montini, seconded by uh, Dr. Pritchett to approve the strategic education plan as presented. Yes. Um, Fecto? Yes. McMillan? No. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Ramos Montini? Yes. Snyder? No. Tilly? Yes. Yes. And um, Albrich. Yes. Six eyes, two nays. Motion carries. Very good. Thank you very much, board. Thank you for your work on this um, very long, important process. And now we uh, live it in a different way. Um, and now it becomes uh, a living a document and a living process in a very, very different way. I want to thank also Ms. Alice, Ms. Carter, all the staff, and all the members of the community that provided feedback over the last uh, several months on the process. It is 1216. We will reconvene at uh, one o'clock.
after lunch break. Have a good lunch, and I will see you all at one. Thank you. Okay, thank you.